Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all. For those who don't know me, I'm Li Yong Yong, Director of Community Affairs at the ASEAN Secretariat. And on behalf of the ASEAN Secretariat and IRIA, I would like to acknowledge your presence in this forum as we remember the passing away of former Secretary General of ASEAN, Dr. Surin Pitsu, one, one year on. Today, we have invited Dr. Surin's family members and a number of prominent speakers and close associates to present their tributes and memories on Dr. Surin. We will also allow you, the audience, to share your experiences about Dr. Surin later on in the program.
instrumental in establishing area as a regional think tank as well as in institutionalizing the regional integration monitoring office at the ASEAN Secretariat. Besides raising the level of regional social cultural cooperation, Dr. Surin was also a strong supporter of ASEAN economic, economic integration, always believing on the region's inherent dynamism to contribute to the global economy. The frequent troubles at him reminds, reminded other states and nation of ASEAN's successful integration model that no other developing countries or developing region has done so. As for my personal memory of Dr. Surin, I remember him to be a great problem solver and a very capable moderator, especially during difficult negotiation in which he could bring everyone together and balance every stakeholder's interest. This is what I witnessed when I attend all the meeting and negotiation where Dr. Surin was part of the uh, problem solver. It is my hope that this forum will inspire us to embed Dr. Surin's passion for turning ASEAN into a friendly but yet influential region and global player in all aspects of our development. To quote Winston Churchill, the only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his action. I believe that shield was the highest form of tribute to honor the memory of Dr. Suri. Thank you very much. Thank you, SG. Indeed, as SG had highlighted in his remark, a lot of us, especially those in the ASEAN circuit, do recognize Dr. Surin for his can-do spirit, upbeat attitude, and his suave oral skills. The next section, which is a video, will perfectly capture Dr. Surin's lead role in ASEAN as a diplomat, statesperson, politician, colleague, friend, and an advocate. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the next five minutes of this clip. You really wouldn't feel it's five minutes long. Surin, for me, uh, was unique and special, and I hope he sets an example. He was somebody that who could combine the local and the global perspectives of what politicians need to do. This time, ASEAN will have to find, and will have to identify and we'll have to seize that opportunity. That opportunity that ASEAN stands for a principle. And that principle is nothing but a peaceful resolution of problems, of conflicts, of dispute. ASEAN stands on certain principle. Firmly, ASEAN will be recognized. The first Secretary General of ASEAN with a foreign ministerial rank, one of Dr. Surin's missions was to convey the ASEAN way and its wisdom of peace and economic progress to the world. I think he saw a big ASEAN. He saw an ASEAN which is more a regional viewpoint, rather than just simply the 
minimum that 10 different doctors would agree on. We have to make sure that every member state identifies with the regional objective and regional vision. And we must be able to drive that vision. We must be able to enlist our people, 620 million of them, to be excited about that vision. Dr. Surin was always a vocal a supporter of ASEAN as an organization on the global stage. Asia must make itself known and must deliver its vision and its aspiration to the global community more effectively, more consistently, and certainly more frequently. Dr. Surin promoted ASEAN as a rules-based organization with its 10 members committed to universal principles. I think he saw the need to be utter so relevant to human needs. And uh, on different issues like democracy, human rights, I think he was able to react to it much more positively, much more uh, intuitive, much more comfortably with these ideas to say, these are Western ideals, but they have a home here in ASEAN. Dr. Surin worked to augment interaction with civil society organizations as part of his efforts to realize the people-centered community of ASEAN. When Cyclone Nargis struck Myanmar in 2008, he worked closely with ASEAN foreign ministers to convince Myanmar's government to allow international humanitarian teams in to work alongside local civil society organizations. There was a huge uh, standoff between the Myanmar authorities and the outsiders who had offered to help to relieve the damage and the suffering caused by Saigon Nagis to the southern part of Myanmar. So Surin applied his uh, diplomatic skills and his long-held belief. And after some quick movement around, he was able to bring diverse groups together and form what we now call the tripartite core group. For ASEAN, our humanitarian work which led to the formation of the AHA Center, ASEAN Center for Humanitarian Assistance, can be said to be a direct outcome of uh, Surin's clever on-the-spot management of the issues and problems in the aftermath of the psycho Nagis. Basic point is said human life must be treasured. Today, the success of the humanitarian operations with regard to Nagis cycle encourage Myanmar to engage ASEAN intensively, but also has confidence to engage the international community. It contributed to no small amount of the more engaging Myanmar. That, to me, leading by March 2010, an open and democratic Myanmar. So that is why we miss him so much. He is a, of course, a true believer in not only a true believer in ASEAN, but he is an activist. He would like to move. What well, the one thing I think everybody remembers, um, Dr. Surin, is his smile. So despite all the problems, obstacles, or challenges, he was always there with a smile. So I would like to pay tribute to him for that contribution to the development of ASEAN family, ASEAN community uh, feeling and awareness. First, he's a great leader of ASEAN, and number two, he's a great friend of all of us who were active then. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lineup of six renowned speakers, as I mentioned today, namely Professor Hirotoshi, Hirotoshi Nishimura, His Excellency Dr. Supachai, Professor Devi Fortuna Anwar, Ambassador Dile Albe, Honorable Sukamban Paribata, and Pak Dimas.
or his long name, Pameda Tama Suryo Dino Krat, excuse me, for short, to start these speeches in remembrance of Dr. Surin's session, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, who is the president of IRIA. He was recently reappointed for another five years term in June 2018. Prof Nishimura, or Sensei as we call him, graduated from the University of Tokyo and obtained his postgraduate degree in Yale University. Uh, he began his illustrious working journey with the Japanese government and subsequently assumed numerous key positions, notably overseeing Japan's strategic relationship with ASEAN and China. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hand to Professor Nishimura. Mrs. Arisa Pison, Maudi Pison, Tsuhudi Pison. This is very difficult to pronounce. Uh, Swadir Pison, His Excellency Datori Mujokhoi. Secretary General of ASEAN, His Excellency Dr. Spachai Panshipat, former Director General of the World Trade Organization and UNCTAD, High Excellency Ambassador Derry Arbert, former Foreign Secretary of the Philippines, Professor Davy Fortuna Anwar, Vice Chairman of the Habibi Center. His Excellency Sukuhun Pahand Paribatra, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand, Mr. Mayor Tama Suryodini Grat, President, Director of Antara News, and Honorable Ambassadors to ASEAN, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to express my sincere thanks to all of you for participating in Dr. Srin Piswan's Tribute Forum. I am greatly honored to host this memorial forum with His, His Excellency Dato Rimujo Khoi and ASEAN Secretariat. One year has already passed since the world faced the greatest sorrow on 30th November 2017. A statesman without a parallel, a man of both vision and warmth, a leader for ASEAN like no other in Asia. Indeed, the whole world suffered a great loss. A Bangkok Post editorial called him ASEAN's de facto foreign minister. This was because he was not only its first secretary general, which had a foreign minister rank, but he also grew ground the world in enthusiast carry at the face of ASEAN, attending many international conferences, focuses, and giving many lectures, devote himself to this very honorable mission. As you know, his lectures and speeches always had his humor and insight. His lifestyle embodied his own words, my office is in the sky. Why? <laughs> Most regional integration efforts around the world now seems to be in shambles. Srin was successful and single-handedly conveying to the world the ASEAN message that diversity could also be the real source of strength for the regional grouping. 
Dr. Srin also played an important role in implementing the ASEAN Charter, which took effort, effect in 2008. Under his leadership, ASEAN was elevated to a rule-based international organization with universal principles held by its 10 member states. In that sense, Dr. Srin can be described at the man of the ASEAN integration. Dr. Srin was very passionate about augmenting interactions with the civil society organization as part of his efforts to realize a people-centered ASEAN community. He transformed the ASEAN Secretariat into a network society secretariat, strengthened ties with ASEAN and its member states and all over the world. He strongly believed that interaction with civil society organization would strengthen the ASEAN community. When Cyclone Nargis caused extensive damage in Myanmar in 2008, he energetically worked together with ASEAN foreign ministers to convince Myanmar's government to allow international humanitarian teams to work alongside local civil society organizations. Of course, we cannot fail to mention that his activities related to the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area he was also deeply involved in the founding of area. Dr. Srin and I had overcome several difficulties together from the every start of area. I remember it like it was yesterday. After retiring as Secretary General of ASEAN, he was the most strongest special advisor to area, the providing guidance and inspirations. His belief was that world-class economic research and policy recommendation for challenges based on such research are indispensable for ASEAN economic progress and prosperity. As a true leader of ASEAN, even well after his team as Secretary General, Tom, as Secretary General, he devoted himself fully to promoting the dream of the peaceful and prosperous region where every person would be a member of a caring and sharing community, a people-oriented ASEAN. Dr. Srin risked his own life to address challenges in the East Asian region such as human rights, democracy, education, political reform, and economic integration. It is no exaggeration to say that what drove him was his love for the ASEAN region, where he lived. We are forever grateful for Dr. Srin for his deep contributions to the development not only this region, but also the world. Before ending my remark, I would like to announce that the fourth Asia Cosmopolitan Awards Selection Committee decided to give Dr. Srin the memorable award to praise his contribution to ASEAN development through his passion in augmenting interactions with civil society organization as part of his efforts to realize a people-centered community and by strenuous giving aspirations of regional integration in East Asian at various international scenes. Dr. Srin had also made a great contribution to the award as a selection committee member. Now, is a time that we must say goodbye to this true gentleman, statement, friend, 
and leader who gave so much to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nishimura. I would like to welcome our next speaker, uh, His Excellency Dr. Supachai Panish Pakdi. Dr. Supachai, of course, doesn't need too long an introduction. He was formerly the Deputy Finance Minister, Commerce Minister, and twice DPM, Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand. He was also the first representative of the developing country to be appointed Director General of the WTO from 2002 to 2005, and subsequently with two terms of Secretary Generalship of UNTAD from 2005 to 2013. One of his legacy in UNTAD, as I was told, was to establish a panel of eminent persons to oversee the start of the reform of uh, UNTAD. Dr. Supachai received his PhD at the Netherlands School of Economics and has published widely on economics and trade development. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Supachai. Your Excellency, the Secretary General of, of ASEAN, Mr. Lim Chok Hoi, Your Excellency Professor Nishimura, President of the area, my good old friend, although he's not that much old, but a long time friend, Kun Alisa Pitsuan, somebody that uh, we should not forget to mention in the same breath as when we mentioned Dr. Suin's performance, including her family here, distinguished guests and participants, dear friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I always feel uh, as an humbling experience every time I've been asked to talk about Dr. Surin as an ASEAN personality. Because throughout the last 30 years that we've known each other, when we actually started our political career at the same time in 1986 when we ran for a seat in the parliament on behalf of our political party. Now we met each other before and we know each other before and always as a friend and more than a friend as part of my, my family as we call always each other brothers all the time. Still rings very much in my head every time Surin calls me. Everywhere in the world he ever found himself and where I was in the world. The first word was not, would not be hello. The first word would be P. He would say P and then I would know it's Surin calling and then I would answer the phone. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to to write or to annotate whatever huge, massive performances uh, Dr. Surin has actually accumulated in his life. And, and I always got frightened every time I have to think of what somebody like him could achieve even the multiples of what has what he has achieved before his passing. He always said to me, uh, every time I had to go on stage, I would be shaking. I would be shaking. And I said, shaking for what? Because I don't think you have any state fright. He said, no, not, not state fright. But I'm shaking because I'm thrilled to be able to speak to the people, to be able to express myself my vision and the way that he would like everyone to understand each other and I would be quoting the, the, the one poem that he loved so much at the end and that would show how 
what a person Dr. Surin is. Uh, this year, uh, the Asia Foundation held a memorial meeting for Dr. Surin. Uh, I think it was in Washington, D.C. And I'm saying this because I know it will please Dr. Surin to no end. If he would have been able to know, and I'm sure that he'll be somewhere around here, to be able to sense what we are talking, why we're talking about him. And at that meeting in July this year, a former US State Secretary, Madeleine Albright, she was speaking, one of the speakers. And of course, Dr. Surin know Madeleine since the time they were fellow uh, researchers, assistant to a US Congress person uh, by the name of uh, uh, Ferrao, Ger Geraldine Ferrao. Uh, that was the time that uh, Dr. Surin was in his youth and uh, enjoyed very much the time there. And he learned to meet Madeleine Albright there as part of another team of advisors to Geraldine Ferraro. And of course, they became fellow ministers. At the meeting in uh, at the uh, Asian Foundation this July, Mandarin was saying something about Dr. Surin, which I have to repeat here, and I quote from her, that Dr. Surin is a champion of international cooperation a kind man and a great proponent of democracy. Now, I'm sure and I hope that Dr. Surin would be able to sense uh, the kind of message like this that was sent out uh, from a person he greatly, he greatly appreciate. I'm sorry to have to say something about myself in connection with Dr. Surin, but Dr. Surin is actually the major player. Because he told me times and again, uh, every time we had the chance to reminisce about our past experience, experiences together, he would be referring to the one phone call that he got from Secretary Albright. I guess it was in the beginning of 19, 1999. And Madeline was on her way from Paris, I think, to Helsinki. She was on a, on a very... Uh, urgent flight at a time that was very difficult for Europe. It was a time of the hostilities uh, in the old, in the former uh, Yugoslavia. And she was on her way to participate in a very crucial peace talk on Kosovo. That was a special meeting held in Helsinki. But at that time even, she took the time to call, to place a call to Dr. Surin. And he told me he was just running on the treadmill. And he was talking to her while running on the treadmill. And the message was about what I was involved in in those days as a, as a candidate for the World Trade Organization Director General position. And Dr. Surin, together with my colleague and friend here, Dr. Sukhumpan, as the people who've been involved very closely, very intimately with the, with the discussion. So much so at that time that the importance of the change in the management of the rather important, significant international organization like the Guteo, that uh, the US administration asked Madeline to place a phone call to Dr. Surin. And he was very proud this moment that the State of Secretary of the United States called him up just to tell him that, look, Surin, what he said was something like this, sorry to be using something like impolite words. He said, to hell with the two candidates. To hell with the two candidates, Mike and Superchai. We are going to search for the third candidate. That was after a long three months of back and forth fighting, and there was no end to it. And she was calling Surin to tell her that, let's call it off. We are going to have another candidate. Surin came back, and that was the reason why probably I'm here, and our long association and the reason for me uh, being uh, granted the opportunity to 
work at the World Trade Organization, Suin actually told her back that, look, Madeline, if we would do that, it would seem to the world that you from the US, major power, and us all at the WTO, smaller nations, we failed in our effort. This is just you know, a small thing. To be able to pass on from one management of the organization to another in a smooth way. And now you're saying, after all these three or four months of back and forth negotiations, we are calling out. He said, no, you cannot do that. Let's start talking about how we can decide on the terms and everything. And that was the beginning of the final solution in us sharing the terms. And that was uh, something that uh, Dr. Surin had a big hand in there. And he was always very proud of that moment. Uh, there are so many moments in our life that we, we touch uh, each other. And uh, I remember the time even when before Dr. Surin uh, came to us in here. He was already very much in favor of what we at the UN like to call open regionalism. Open regionalism. It was in the 1990s and we were deciding whether we would like to invite countries in Indochina, particularly Vietnam, to join us. And it was Dr. Suwin who gave us in Thailand a very strong and I would say decisive push to facilitate, to help Vietnam to make this decision from both sides, from Vietnam side and ASEAN side, and particularly from Thailand side, that in order to have a really open reg regionalism, to have really peace, and peace is something Dr. Suwin was always talking about, as Secretary General has already referred to, we must have Vietnam in ASEAN. And this is something that is very well recognized in in those days because it was not, it was just an early day after the hostilities in that region. Dr. Surin was always not only trying to operationalize the ASEAN Charter as a few of us know so well, but at the same time he was trying to be very forward looking and always trying to tackle issues like we've seen with the issues of Cyclone Nagis in Myanmar. But the one area in which he was trying to tackle, which is to try to make sense of the kind of so-called non-interference principle. I mean, of course, that's a basic principle of ASEAN, non-interference. But Suin, I thought it was, who introduced the concept of flexible engagement. Flexible engagement meaning that we're not really interfering, but we can be engaged. We can be talking to each other of our own problems, of problems that would affect our neighbors, or our neighbors' problems that would affect us. And so be able to have some dialogues before things would fly out. And I always appreciate the way he's always been, been very forward-looking. Very forward-looking in a way that Secretary General and also Professor Nishimura has already talked about to try to actually reorganize the ASEAN Secretariat in a way that it could be a network secretariat, a nerve center of the operation of ASEAN. Why Suwin himself tries to move around the world to propound the kind of principles that ASEAN stands on. And one time he was with us in, uh, in Davos, I was with the UN people, and Surin came with a team from ASEAN. And he was seated on the podium with a few ASEAN leaders, and he was the last one to conclude. And he said the same thing as the Secretary General Lim Chok Hoi was just said a few moments ago. That after, he said, after all, all these problems around the world that, we hear, that we've been hearing, I can assure you the audience from all over the world at the Davos World Economic Forum meeting that ASEAN will be one region that would never create any problem for you. So you can always count on us. And that was a very reassuring, a reassuring uh, statement uh, after the flare-ups of the Arab Spring, the problems in the Eastern Europe, problems in the Middle East and elsewhere in Latin America. And he, Dr. Surin was saying that. I met Surin during his time 
everywhere in the world. In Davos, in Geneva, in Delhi, uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, but rarely here in Jakarta. And I always ask him, are you still with ASEAN? He said, P, yes, but my office is in the air, it's in the sky. I always sit in the air and work and write and do things and thinking and I'm just trying to network, network for everyone. And his, uh, his uh, networking, he even organized, I was told, uh, some of the exhibitions in Italy uh, to have a sort of networking with Europe. And, uh, was a real effort. The way he tried to put ASEAN charter into operation is not just plainly operationalizing things, <laughs> contents of the charter. But he went around, I heard him talk, I, I heard that he talked to Madeleine Albright, explaining to him why this charter will have to work. And particularly the person, it was, it was Hillary Clinton, who came to see him and put all questions about this Charter, and she said it would never work for you because you are so different, you are so diverse. You cannot always reconcile to put in a charter. And then Surin began to lecture to Hillary. And he said to her, Look, a few hundred, year, hundred years ago, you have Thomas Jefferson writing all this new constitution for you. Every man is born equal, and all this sort of, you know, the long lecture. And lo and behold, now you see nothing was mentioned about African uh, American in the Constitution. And lo and behold, now you have President Obama as the head of your, your administration, head of state. This can happen. Same thing, I'll make it happen here in, 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 in ASEAN. It will work for everyone, and everyone here is equal. And you know what he said? He said, thank you so much, Professor. Many ep well, anecdotes could be said about Surin, and I'm sorry to be a bit incoherent, not to be telling you of all the technicalities of what he did, but of my reminiscence of what he told us. We've always been in ASEAN uh, commented on by outsiders that uh, we are a land and region of, of so many different multicultural communities. How can you manage this? Surin was always saying, this is, we have to turn it into our strength. He said, this is a strength in diversity. He's, he always talked about his background. And you certainly are well versed, you know about Dr. Surin's background. A background of highly intellectual family and community from where he came from in the South Thailand. But the wonderful thing is that in daytime, Dr. Surin went to a normal school, community school, which taught him to recant Buddhist prayers. And he remembers all that. And in the evening, he went to Muslim religious classes, or not classes, and he was taught the Quran. And with that kind of background, Dr. Suwin always has been mediating, playing mediating roles, trying to make everyone live together, understanding each other in peace. I was, I was so amazed to find that at one of the most famous Buddhist monasteries in the northern part of Thailand, managed by one of our most famous Buddhist monks, that Dr. Suwin would go there every year, every year, not as a Buddhist, but as an international diplomat, as a former minister of foreign affairs, every year he would go there for five consecutive years to lecture to the novices there. And they all appreciated his appearances because he was always talking about how we all can live together, how we can have aspirations, inspirations, and that we can all be successful together. And this is really a most touching experience that he was working on behalf really of everyone and string in diversity. He kept telling me about this anomaly. He said, look at the way we ASEAN settle our differences. There was one time that we had to decide on the sort of a dispute about this temple 
call Prasad Pravihan, the Pravihan Temple. This is what he said, a dispute between two Buddhist states over a Hindu temple, which has a Muslim, one former foreign minister of Indonesia, as an interlocutor. So it was really a strength in diversity that we are applying all our different culture in sorting out our own problems. ASEAN centrality is to all of us and to me, sacrosanct. And I can see that as I now, I'm now handling some of the, I would say, the, the new generation of economic cooperation, integration with the likes of India and China as I'm going through some of the exercises with the Belt and Road Initiative with China and the string of pearls with India and things like that. And Dr. Surin, and of course, all of you are involved with ASEAN affairs. We have always to hold the line with ASEAN centrality. And this is something that uh, Dr. Surin has put his uh, life work behind, to try to induce everyone to accept and look at us at real centrality in whatever we do. And the same thing I'm now trying to pass on to the forthcoming major powers that are arising in, in Asia, that whatever kind of power that they may be able to wield, ASEAN must be kept, must be conferred a role of centrality to help in being the honest broker, in being somebody in between to keep peace, keep prosperity, keep our trade going on, investment, and whatever economic and social involvement that could be generated in this part of the world. At one time, uh, when uh, there was this launch, I think in 2012, the launch of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in Phnom Penh, Surin was trying to organize a so-called global dialogue meeting. All the time he's been trying for years but could not succeed. Uh, one time he in invited a former Secretary General of UN, Ban Ki-moon, to come, but at that time, Phnom Penh, we were launching the RCEP and there was heads of state from all the, all the world, including the uh, likes of uh, President Obama. And he invited us and invited Lamy from the WTO at that time, me from the UN, and uh, I think it was Kuruda Sang from, uh, from, from ADB at that time before he went on to be the governor of the Central Bank of Japan. And he was organizing a sort of global dialogue involving us and together with the heads of governments and states uh, around the table in Phnom Penh really to make sure that they all understand as we move towards a regional FTAs, regional integration like RCEP, we have to play the role, we meaning ASEAN, the role of centrality. The cyclone Nargis has been quoted many times here and around the world, and one of my dear friends, Nolene Heiser, who used to be the Secretary General of ESCA, she used to say this is ASEAN baptism by cyclone. ASEAN baptism by cyclone. I remember the day because it came at a time I was still at the UN and we were at a loss how to deal with the case of Myanmar. Because as you know, in those days, we have sanctions on Myanmar. And much as UN would like to come in, much as Myanmar would like to accept the system, we could not do. Neither side could move. And only when we contacted ASEAN and through Dr. Surin, and you can see his performance there, that was really baptism by cyclone. It was a move that was not only humanitarian, but it was a move that placed ASEAN in the center of affairs of disaster management that we so much at the UN at that time, I talked to my friends at the World Meteorological Organization that it was very difficult and ASEAN Asia would have to be able to, be able to manage confrontation with the more greater frequencies of natural disasters. And it was a great demonstration of the, of the capacity, ability of ASEAN to stretch out our hands. And I think there was a time in Japan also during one of the, one of the uh, tsunami disasters in Japan that Surin was rallying around ASEAN, all ASEAN members' country, as much as smaller, poorer than we are in Japan, at least to show our spirit, our compassion for our friends in Japan to rally certain help to be sent to Japan. Even after he, after he has left, 
I know that Suwin was always has left ASEAN. He was always on top of things, of the question of the uh, minority group like the Rakhine in, in Myanmar, and he was always asking about the situation there and what kind of thing that he can play a role to help. You've seen what uh, friends of Dr. Suwin has been saying, but I just would like to quote just one one more. Uh, uh, a statement from the former uh, Secretary General of ASEAN, uh, Dr. Ong Keng, Ong Keng Long. He said at one of the meetings we held in, uh, in Bangkok some months ago by the ISIS in Chulalongkorn University, uh, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong was saying that he remembered Suwin for three very memorable things about Dr. Suwin. The first one is his humanitarian role peacemaking, peacekeeping, and always Dr. Suwin was reciting and emphasizing that Islam is about peace. Secondly, his imaginative thinking, his approach, always uh, trying to maximize opportunities whenever he saw, always working very hard as we all know. And thirdly, uh, he's a real patriot of Thailand, a good Thai personality, a very, very, uh, uh, I don't know how to call it, an, 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 a unique uh, uh, representative of, uh, of Thailand. And also, I think uh, I think one of our friends here, uh, Kun Kavi, who used to call him a real ASEAN foreign minister, very appropriate uh, position. Before I end, I'd like to quote uh, from so in most love uh, poem, and this is there was a poem that was written as a prose. It was written by an English poet, a cleric from Church of England by the name of John Dong. He's from 17th century, and I have to cite this again and again because I know he loves this uh, this poem, this prose. It's a it's a part of a bigger essay that John Don wrote on manifestation in, this, in his days and ages. And this part was called For Whom the Bell Tolls. For Whom the Bell Tolls. And we know it from uh, a later uh, novel by Somerset Maugham. And it goes like this. I, I took some part of the thing because it's, uh, it impressed him so much. It impressed me so much every time I hear it from, from him. No man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, said not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. All this has a very deep meaning, as you know, that we are always part of each other. We are part of each other. We are from one same origin, always part. And this is what Dr. Swin believes in. And he loves that sentence, each man death diminishes me. Because we die a little when our colleagues, our friends around, we pass away. And from, for us, for you all, I know, and for me particularly, with the passing of Dr. Swin, that diminishes me greatly. It's indescribable. And in this age, uh, when the global system, global governance system seems to be in disarray, we miss someone so much, uh, like Dr. Suin, who this actually has been a great loss, not only to our ASEAN community, but to the, the whole wide world. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Supachai. <laughs> Honorable guests, I would like to introduce you a very powerful woman from Southeast Asia, Ambassador Delia Domingo Elbert, who received her first degree from the University of the Philippines before studying at a number of institutions overseas, including Geneva and Harvard. Her career in the Department of Foreign Affairs in the Philippines began as an assistant to the then Foreign Secretary. Narcissos Ramos, who is one of the ASEAN founding fathers. Between 69 and 1990, and between 95 and 2002, 
ambassador Albert served in various capacities in Filipinos diplomatic missions abroad with an appointment as DG of ASEAN in between those two periods. Even the mic is failing me, I'm sorry. Ambassador Delia was Philippines uh, Foreign Secretary, as I mentioned, between December 03 and August 04. She was appointed the Knight Commander Cross of the Order of Merit with Stars of Germany in 1992 for her efforts to promote relation between Manila and Berlin and in that sense the greater relation between ASEAN and EU and in January 2004 President Gore Makapaka Arroyo conferred on her the order of Sikatuna with a rank of a Tato for her able and meritorious services to the Philippines Ladies and gentlemen, can I present to you Ambassador Dilia? Good morning, Excellencies, family of Dr. Savin Pitsuan, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank and congratulate a dear friend and colleague, Lim Jokhoi, for taking over the helm of the ASEAN Secretariat and for hosting today's event. I would like to also thank uh, Professor Nishimura for organizing this and contributing so much for the growth of ASEAN. At the 20th summit of ASEAN leaders, Surin Pitsuan, the 12th Secretary General of ASEAN, said, quote, if the ASEAN summit is the brain, then the Secretariat is its heart. So Lim Jok Sot, you have the heart of ASEAN beating right here in Jakarta. Surin expressed the view that the Secretariat is at the heart of all the other ASEAN organs, and that it is the only one which represents an exclusively ASEAN character and the collective interests of ASEAN. His message was clear, that for ASEAN to sustain its centrality, it has to be strong internally. Indeed, according to one of Serene's predecessors, former ASEAN Secretary General, Rodolfo Severino of the Philippines said, and I quote, Surin has been very good for the organization as his activist inclination fits with the expanded mandate given to the Secretary General under the ASEAN Charter, end of quote. Moreover, he emphasized, which we have heard earlier, that as a former foreign minister, Serene brought a stature that those who preceded him did not. I could not agree more. As a former foreign minister myself and an ASEAN DG, I have been fortunate to witness and admire Serene at work during various stages of his public life. His passion in serving ASEAN's interest which one could even call, quote, his love affair with ASEAN, was evident not only during his term as Secretary General of ASEAN from 2008 to 2012, but even beyond as he consistently and convincingly worked incessantly to build a global profile for our region. I first saw Surin at the airport in Canberra, Australia. Somebody pointed him to me and described him as that, quote, that tall man with a backpack, end of quote. A common friend, the Thai ambassador to Australia, Laksana Chantorn Lauhapan, later introduced us at a diplomatic reception held in his honor. Before our posting to Australia, Lexana and I had served together as ASEAN DGs. 
and were often referred to as the, quote, the majority of two, being the only two women among the four male DG colleagues. We were quite notorious for teaming up and conspiring to get things done efficiently and effectively as we did not spend time on the golf course. You know what I mean. It was during our time as DGs that ASEAN leaders mandated us to work on the restructuring of the ASEAN Secretariat for consideration of the summit in Singapore in 1992. It was a tall order which we took very seriously. So seriously that even one of the DGs went so far as to suggest to change the ASEAN logo which Laksana and I objected to for some reason or the other. We felt that branding ASEAN was already difficult at the time and if we changed the logo, it would be even more challenging to get it known around the world. In Australia, Serene had a number of good friends. Among them, Tim Fisher, who was also a dear friend, the Australian Deputy Prime Minister, who always took occasion to speak highly of Serene. Serene was introduced as a possible ASEAN candidate for the post of Secretary General of the United Nations, which we worked for rather assiduously. There was palpable excitement over the possibility that ASEAN would make it to the helm of the United Nations. Unfortunately, it was not to be. Eventually, ASEAN's loss became ASEAN's gain. As Secretary General, he presided over the so-called, quote, midlife crisis of ASEAN. Serene saw and articulated the urgent need to enhance ASEAN's capacity, streamline decision-making processes, reconfigure its working procedures, as well as adopt a new mindset of proactive engagement by moving away from what he called the passive ASEAN way of the past. A dynamic speaker for ASEAN who came with superb credentials Serene shared his vision on the future of ASEAN at the golden anniversary celebrations of ASEAN in October held last year in Manila. Serene reminded us at that meeting of Tanat Koman, one of the founding fathers of ASEAN, who five decades before him expressed great hopes for ASEAN and its role as a credible platform for consultations and exchanges amongst major players that have a direct interest in the stability and peace of the region. However, he also raised the need for a reassessment of the very slow, very deliberative ASEAN way in decision making. To remember and honor Serene is to know and to listen to his learned and sound advice. In his essay, and perhaps what I consider his last will and testament to us all, entitled in his article, ASEAN After 50 and Beyond, A Personal Reflection, which is contained in the book, series of books, the ASEAN journey, a contribution, a major contribution of the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia or ARIA to celebrate the golden anniversary of ASEAN. Surin's messages in that article were clear and succinct. Firstly, that ASEAN must deliver on the agreed commitments as set out in the charter of 200, 2007. Second, that there is an urgent need for solidarity in ASEAN's posturing 
towards external partners. Thirdly, that a people-oriented organization is imperative with the popular participation and support of an increasingly aware and prosperous constituency. Fourth, that regional economic integration be widened by including other wider, larger economies close to us in the region. Fifth, that ASEAN mobilize resources to facilitate transport and other linkages to connect its people and goods across the ASEAN landscape. Finally, I'd like to echo Serene's prescription for ASEAN survival for the next 50 years by calling for greater cohesiveness in its community coordination and more innovators in managing ASEAN's much heralded past accomplishments. Moreover, to truly succeed as it moves to the second half century, ASEAN will require the full ownership and active participation and meaningful contributions of all its peoples. At a forum in Manila on the 50th anniversary of ASEAN last October, Serin confirmed what I have always been concerned, that ASEAN is not quite in the consciousness of its people. A new ASEAN, a post-2017 ASEAN, would have to make sure that younger generations, the private sector, civil society, the media, are inspired by the vision of ASEAN. And I was delighted to hear this morning the message of the Secretary General that the focus of ASEAN in the next coming years would be to bring the community of people together. It is for this reason that I have initiated the ASEAN Society of the Philippines, a private sector-led group to engage the general public with ASEAN. Perhaps this was ASEAN's message to us. ASEAN to Serene was meant to be a, quote, a democratic construct, end of quote. He challenged the next generation of leadership not to deviate from that sacred path of the first 50 years. Certainly, Serene, that tall man with a backpack, left us all tall orders to share with the young backpackers who will eventually lead the way for a people's ASEAN. Thank you, Serene. We shall continue to listen and we shall remember. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Our fourth speaker is a well-known figure in Indonesia. Professor David Fortuna Anwar straddles the world of academic, political activism and government. She is a research professor in Indonesia Institute of Sciences and vice chair of board of directors of Habibi Center. Professor David received her PhD from Monash University and was the Kippenberger visiting chair at Victoria University in Wellington and a distinguished visiting professor at RSIS in Singapore. From 2010 to 2017, Ibu Devi served as the Deputy Secretary to the Vice President of Indonesia, and she has written widely on Indonesia democratization, foreign policy, as well as on ASEAN political security developments. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Devi Anwar. Excellency, the Secretary General of ASEAN, family members of the late Papa Surin Pitswan, Ibu Alisa, Ibu Pitswan, and uh, the boys, the honorable speakers, uh, Pak Nishimura, 
Ibu Delia, Pak uh, Supacai, Kun Sukumban, and of course uh, uh, Med, uh, Mas Medi Dimas. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly an honor for me to be counted among the close friends of the very distinguished and beloved former Secretary General of ASEAN, the late Dr. Suin Putsuan, and to be invited to pay my tribute to him alongside the other distinguished speakers. It has been one year since Dr. Surin passed away so suddenly, and I would like to share with you again today what I wrote last year, soon after hearing the sad news, which was then published in the Jakarta Post on 5th of December in 2017 because I looked at it again, and since that article was written, the fullness of heart at the time, I felt that I encapsulated my, my feelings and grief at the time. When first hearing the news of Dr. Surin Fitzwan's death on the Thursday, 30th of November, 2017, from a friend, my first reaction was disbelief. After reading the link of the news in the Bangkok Post, I was shocked and unbearably saddened. I regard Pak Surin Pitswan as a mentor and a good friend whose compassion and vision for a more humane global and regional order I have always admired and aspired to emulate. My terrible shock at hearing Dr. Surin's sudden passing, however, was not only because it was so unexpected, but because only a week earlier, we had both attended the World Conference on Islamic Thought 2017, organized by the University Sultan Aslan Shah on the 20th and 21st of November in Ipoh, Malaysia. Earlier on, on 5th and 6th October 2017, both of us also participated in the second East Asia, West Asia seminar in Amman, Jordan, organized by the Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Surin Pitswan was truly a man for all seasons. He was a learned scholar of Islam, an expert on international relations, a distinguished politician in Thailand, and a renowned diplomat. He served as one of the most distinguished foreign ministers of Thailand from 1997 to 2001, and a trade-blazing Secretary General of ASEAN from 2008 to 2012. Dr. Surin was a true intellectual and an analytical thinker, but what made him truly outstanding was that he was always an inspirational speaker with remarkable facility with words, as Dr. Supichai mentioned, able to speak about complex issues in ways that were easily understood by his listeners. Equally important, and what made him so endearing was the fact that Pak Surin was always gracious, charming, and just generally a very nice human being who remained humble despite his many accomplishments. The theme of the 2017 World Conference on Islamic Thought was global peace, and Dr. Surin was one of the distinguished speakers at the plenary opening session on the 20th of November, and his delivery was classic Surin. Drawing from his education in his family's Islamic pondok in Nakhon Sitamarat and Egypt, where he was educated, Dr. Surin was able to recite verses from the Quran and quoted the Hadith and about the true meaning of Islam as a religion of peace, ex exemplified by its very name and the Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum, or peace be with you. Dr. Surin talked knowledgeably about the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and the ideals of Islam as a blessing for the world, Rahmatin Lil Alamin, and then conveyed his criticisms and concerns about how the name of Islam has lately been misused and abused by a small group of extremists and terrorists which have threatened global peace and our common humanity. That evening, the two of us, moderated by Tan Sri Razali Ismail, a former Malaysian ambassador to the United Nations, talked about conflicts and achieving peace in Southeast Asia. Dr. Suin, Surin reminisced about his time as Thai Prime Minister and how President 
BJ Habibi, and I served President BJ Habibi at the time, in the aftermath of the ballot in East Timor in 1999, and called on Thailand and the other ASEAN countries to send troops as peacekeepers to restore peace in East Timor, and this was unprecedented at the time. This was the first time that an ASEAN member state had called on fellow ASEAN members to send in peacekeepers. Indonesia, of course, would later invite ASEAN and the, other, and the European Union to monitor the implementation of the Helsinki Peace Agreement that ended the drawn out conflict in Aceh in 2005. Dr. Surin Pitswan belonged to the second generation of ASEAN leaders who had the vision to transform these regional organizations from its minimalist beginning to its true potential as an ASEAN community that is people-oriented, people-driven, and people-centered. When it was first established in 67, ASEAN was envisaged as, a, as an intergovernmental association aimed at promoting good neighborly relations with limited substantive cooperation. While the principles of sovereignty, equality, and non-intervention in each other's domestic affairs have been enshrined in the 1948 United Nations Charter, ASEAN seems to have made these principles its very own immutable rules. Surin Pitswan, from his time as Deputy Foreign Minister and then Foreign Minister of Art Thailand, was one of the visionary leaders of ASEAN who understood that time has changed, that globalization has blurred the distinction between the internal and the external making all countries and peoples within the region and between different regions interconnected with one another. As then Foreign Minister of Thailand, Dr. Surin took the lead in persuading ASEAN to push the military hunter in Myanmar to ease its tight political control and release its political prisoners, including the Nobel Peace Prize recipient Aung San Suu Kyi. While many other ASEAN foreign ministers then remained hesitant, Dr. Surin promoted the idea of ASEAN's constructive engagement with Myanmar, later softened to flexible engagement or enhanced interruption. And at the time, as an Indonesian, I was very envious of Thailand, who had the dynamic duo then, the Foreign Minister Surin Pitsuan and the Deputy Foreign Minister Kun Sukumban, who were in fact the trailblazers of ASEAN. During his tenure as the Secretary General of ASEAN, Dr. Pitswan worked hard to transform the image of ASEAN as a purely government-driven organization and make it more responsive to the needs of the peoples. Although the ASEAN Charter, adopted at the 13th ASEAN Summit in 2007 and came into effect in December 2008, already contains various principles which would make ASEAN into a truly people-centered and people-driven regional community, it was not easy for Secretary General Surin Pitswan to change the culture of ASEAN. Pak Surin was often invited to speak in forums organized by civil society groups, including here in Indonesia, where he would underline the need for ASEAN to speak in, uh, to strive for democracy and respect human rights. But at times, he was rebuked for his activism by some of the representatives of ASEAN member states. I'm sure that the current Secretary General will not have your wrist too often slapped by the firm representatives. But I remember at the time, times quite, quite, quite often, Pak Surin would deliver uh, uh, his, his many speeches in various civil society forums, and then uh, he would be severely criticized uh, uh, by, by some of the permanent members, uh, representatives here. And, and, and that was uh, at the time when uh, ASEAN was truly trying to reform uh, itself. ASEAN's journey to become a prosperous and truly sharing and caring community, as well as a political and security committee in which there is not only peace between states, but also peace within states, is still long and fraught with various dangers and obstacles. Dr. Surin Pitswan's untimely passing has deprived us of a great and visionary leader and ASEAN's most prominent spokesman. Rest in peace, Pak Surin. We will nurture your legacy. This was what I wrote just you know, the moment I heard about his death. But uh, I would like to uh, refer to one of the uh, points that was made by Dr. Supichai 
about Dr. Surin's desire to transform the ASEAN Secretariat into a network ASEAN Secretariat. At the time, he actually appointed me together with a German scholar. And this was paid for by the German uh, at the time, Inwen, now I, I think it's, it's changed, to look into a network ASEAN Secretariat. We actually finished the studies. We delivered the, the, the study report to the Secretary General, but I do not know. If I know about bureaucracy, usually it will be filed somewhere, never to be seen not again. But uh, I hope that that, 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 that study, uh, if you can find the, the key to the filing cabinets, and may, maybe it will be worthwhile looking at it again. The idea at the time was that it is not necessary to make a bloated bureaucracy in ASEAN uh, in the way that uh, the EU uh, has become very big. But what we can do is to leverage the networks look, working through the different centers of excellence within ASEAN so that at any one time, ASEAN could call on all of the existing expertise and then you know, we can, uh, uh, through ASEAN, acting as a conductor, we can actually develop various cooperation. One of the suggestions that we made at the time was if ASEAN, since ASEAN has already established the uh, ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, is to have uh, a role, uh, a database of all of the experts in ASEAN who are specialists in peace and conflict studies and with experience in mediation of conflicts and so on. And, and if we could actually have all that database in our, at our fingertips, the ASEAN Secretariat can then call on those people. And, 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 the, and, and the different issues uh, that ASEAN needs you know, can have that. But the most important thing is the database. And the stumbling block at the time was, of course, that the server in ASEAN was not big enough. And, 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 uh, and the, 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 the computer systems needed to, update, to be updated and so on. It's extremely technical. But I hope that you will revisit the Secretary General, that you will revisit this issue again and maybe truly realize this vision of a network ASEAN Secretariat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Budibi. Ladies and gentlemen, our fifth speaker is a close friend of Dr. Surin Pisuan. Mong Rajavonse Sukamban Pariprata is a scholar, politician, and a philanthropist. He was a Thai Member of Parliament between 96 and 2008 and was the Deputy Foreign Minister from 97 to 2001. He was elected Governor of Bangkok in 2009 and served until 2016. Honourable Sukamban studied Honourable Sukamban studied philosoph philosophy, politics and economics the University of Oxford, graduating with a bachelor degree in, in 1977. He then did a master in international relations at Georgetown in Washington. Honourable Sukamban has also held vital positions, among others, advisor to the House of Reps, Standing Committee for Foreign Affairs, Chairman of the Ministry of Commerce Advisory Committee of International Commerce. And since 1986, he has been the chair of the Chompok Pantik Foundation, one of Thailand's largest philanthropic organizations. Mong Rajavon says to Kamban, the floor is yours. Excellency Dato Lim Chokhoi, Secretary General of ASEAN, Professor Hide, Hidetoshi Nishimura, President of Area, Big Sister Anissa and the Pisuan family, distinguished uh, speakers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor still heavily tinged by a sense of great sadness and loss for me to be here participating in this tribute forum for His Excellency Dr. Surin Pitsawan. I would like to thank the ASEAN Secretariat and the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia for their kind invitation and hospitality. Dr. Surin was as Thailand's Minister of Foreign Affairs 
and ASEAN Secretary General contributed greatly to the development and progress of regionalism in Southeast Asia. Of this, there cannot be any doubt. But I must acknowledge that other participants present here are for far more qualified than I to pay tribute to Dr. Surin and his contributions to ASEAN. I have been Im immersed in urban politics and administration for far too long to give a worthy appreciation of his many achievements. So I would like to leave that, to, that task to others. However, as one who had known him for nearly four decades, as a friend and a big brother, as a scholar and an academic colleague, and as a fellow MP, and as my boss at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, perhaps, perhaps I can share some perspectives and insights which would enhance our collective appreciation of who he was, what he was, and what he did. Many terms have been used to encapsulate Dr. Serene and his diplomacy. Visionary, idealistic, proactive, internationalist, and so on. But what really struck me most about him was consistency. Consistency of beliefs and consistency of purpose. From the time that he was a barefooted schoolboy in rural Nakhon Sitamara province, he was a Democrat, both with a small D and a big D. Indeed, he took his Thai name, I believe, out of great admiration for Surin Masadip, a well-known and well-respected Democrat Party MP from his province. From the beginning, Dr. Surin was a patriot and was committed to public service, first as a young academic teaching at Thammasat University, and then as a Demo Democrat Party MP. But his sense of patriotism and conception of public service were never, never narrowly defined. He believed that the pursuit of his country's national interests can only be fully effective through interfacing and cooperating at all levels, from state to state level to people to people level. And that public service must involve responsibility beyond one's own territorial and religious bounds. This is why from his early, early career until his last days, he took interest and involved himself in, in many regional and international activities related to many issues ranging from security, regional and international cooperation, human rights, humanitarianism, to the pursuit of a just and pros prosperous world. It was not coincidental that in the early, early aftermath of the Paris Peace Treaty in 1991, when many had thought that the idea of a Southeast Asia 10 was but a pipe dream, Dr. Serene, along with a number of Southeast Asian colleagues from both government and academia, chose to conceive their individual country's long-term security as being in intertwined with the establishment of region-wide cooperation. I would like to think that Dr. Serene's and his colleagues' very early advocacy of a Southeast Asia pen led to Vietnam's early membership of ASEAN in 1995, only a few years after Paris, when, again, not coincidental, the Dr. Serene was Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. And of course, Vietnam's membership was followed soon after by the other three regional states, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia. Nor was it coincidental that in 1999, when the situation in the, the then East Timor worsened, 
Minister for Foreign Affairs, Serin, lost no time in convincing Prime Minister Chun Lee Pai that Thailand, with the diplomatic support of Indonesia, should be in the forefront of international efforts to maintain peace and manage peaceful change in East Timor. In the topsy-turvy world of Thai politics, this kind of enlightened, enlightened consistency of thoughts and action was indeed rare. For myself, one regret is that it was not always understood or appreciated by some of its fellow countrymen. This was evident not only in the case of East Timor, but also in his efforts to encourage positive changes in the political and economic landscape of Myanmar. Another regret is that Dr. Serin did not have an opportunity to demonstrate his vision and his enlightened sense of public good and public service on the global stage as the UN Secretary General. His stature as a successful seasoned and seasoned diplomat and his stature as a moderate Muslim might have made a difference. He could have helped bringing about a world, a world where there is greater understanding of Islam, a world where beliefs in the inevitability of clashes among civilizations would have become what they should have become, merely a passing fad for collective co coffee table conversations. As Ambassador Albert said earlier, the consolation is that the UN's loss was ASEAN's gain. Dr. Serin's pre predecessors and successors as ASEAN Secretary General are all con consummate diplomats with enorm enormous experiences of regional and international affairs. But I think most people here would agree that Dr. Serin is different. No one has led the kind of storied life that he had, and no one could exude the kind of excitement, optimism, and flair in everything he touched. Farewell again, Dr. Serin Pisawan, statesman and diplomat without borders. We still miss you, especially now that Thai politics is about to enter terra incognita, an unknown ter territory, where your vision, your optimism, and your voice of reason would have been of great comfort to a great many people. We miss you, but we also know that your enlightened patriotism and sense of public service will surely continue to inspire the younger generations for many, many more years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sukhambat. Ladies and gentlemen, our final speaker is an individual who is very well known in the journalism sector, in particular in Indonesia. Mr. Mehdi Tama Suryo Dininigrat, or Patimas, as I usually call him, currently serves as the President Director of Antara News Agency. He previously served six years as a member of the Board of Directors at the PT Bina Media, uh, Tangara, that published the Jakarta Post that we read every day. In Jakarta Post, he was the Editor-in-Chief for six years with a journalism experience spanning over 18 years. But Dimas also was a former research fellow at the Harvard University, uh, where the head center of international affairs, and received his bachelor degree and attended graduate school in Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Pat Dimas. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to the family of the late Dr. Surin Pitsuwan, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
Good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to see you all. It is a deep pleasure to be able to be given the opportunity to speak uh, this morning. You know, as the MC was uh, reading out the CVs, especially mine just now, you kind of uh, realize that uh, no matter how much you beef up your CV, it really doesn't mean much if you did not accomplish something in your life the way Dr. Sura did. Now, much has already been written, much has already been said about this great man. Not only today, but over the past year, I can remember that in the first weeks of December, to th uh, December of last year, uh, so many eulogies and remembrances filled both online and offline pages about this man, about lamenting the loss of Dr. Surin. Hence, my greatest appreciation for AREA and the ASEAN Secretariat for holding this wonderful celebration of a man who became to be defined as Mr. ASEAN, as a man who transcended beyond his Thai nationality to become an ASEAN citizen. I cannot be so bold as to ever claim that I, that I knew or even have personal insight into Dr. Surin. We did not share coffee together. We did not swap personal stories. He and I, obviously, are a generation apart. But I think we were all compatriots. We were both compatriots in our love for the region and in our passion for ASEAN. What needs to be said has already been said, and I do not need to repeat how effective and formidable he was as a foreign minister or an ASEAN Secretary General. I do not need to highlight his intellectual brilliance, nor, well, I think his accomplishments are a legacy that really speak as a self-testimony. So let me be very brief and just for a few minutes provide my lasting impressions of a man whose eminence is such that one year later after his demise, we are still gathered to hail his life's work. Three things really I shall always take when anyone mentions the name Surin Pitsuan. The first was his wit. He was always quick with a thoughtful quip. He did not complicate, he simplified, he did not confuse, he explained. He did not deteriorate situations, he ameliorated them, even the most intractable situations. I realized that he was very much the kind of foreign minister, he was very much the kind of secretary general we needed at the time. In hindsight, sometimes I wonder if ASEAN was deserving of him. The second was his eloquence. He spoke to the young about an old man's profession. The eloquence convinced even the thought, the toughest detractors, an eloquence that was, I think, an etalage for his unique brilliance. I remember commenting once on the inclusion of North Korea into the ARF and doubts whether Pyongyang could be a responsible regional actor. He replied, if you treat a child as a child forever, the child will forever be a child. The third, and for me, the primary remembrance of Dr. Surin was, as referred to earlier, his smile. You all know what I'm talking about, and I'm glad the clips gave glimpses of his wonderful smile. Dr. Surin had one of those smiles whose curve could straighten even the toughest misunderstanding. A smile that could melt frosty relationships, and I think a demeanor that he was always a friend. That was a gift only acquired by those special few that was touched by the Almighty. Now, as a Muslim, I think the family of Dr. Surin will understand our teachings that there are two never-ending merits that will continue after, even after one has passed away. The first is a dutiful child that prays for their parents, and the second is the work and knowledge that one leaves behind that is endlessly beneficial. Our presence here is testimony to the latter. 
In closing, let me say this, that in the age of social me media, most people are happy and strive just to exist. But I think that Dr. Surin did something more than that. Dr. Sorin truly lived. And for that, I would like to extend the deepest appreciation to the family of the late Dr. Surin for their support in letting him live. Because in the end, by living, by his life, Dr. Surin Pituan became someone who truly mattered. Wa billahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Patimas. Ladies and gentlemen, we have allocated the next 10 minutes as a platform, an opportunity for our live audience member to share your thoughts on Dr. Surin and his legacy. And for those who are speaking, I seek your cooperation to keep your message brief so that we can have more time for more people to join in the tribute. Please raise your hand if you wish to talk. If I know you, I will identify you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Can we have a rolling mic? Yes. Well, would you like to come to the front? Okay. Uh, okay. You are so beautiful. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shanti Shambhasan. Oh, you want me to stand? No, no, please stand okay. in the middle so that everybody can capture you. Uh, good afternoon, Excellency, and uh, uh, Mr. Fitzwan's uh, relatives, family members. Um, my name is Shanti Shambhasan. Um, I started ASEAN International Advocacy in 2004 during Ong Kim Yong's time. Well, at Ong Kim Yong. I'm still in touch with him in Singapore. After Prof. Ong Kim Yong, uh, Dr. Surin took the leadership. It was at that time very difficult uh, for private sector to even have a decent audience with any officials of the ASEAN Secretariat. Sure, those some of you would resonate here because you know having interaction with the private sector at that time was considered a taboo because then people might think there's something going on and all that. So, but then on the contrary, whatever ASEAN was trying to do was actually to help business grow. And then there was this missing link between the private sector, the feedback and all that, and then the secretariat. So I went to Dr. Surin's office, and uh, you know, I was relatively young at that time. And you know, I was 2004, I was talking about ASEAN to other countries, and everybody looked at me and thought, you know, maybe we have taken something wrong. And, you know, what is ASEAN? And it was not very uh, well known as it is today. So I was carrying the flag and, and going around and talking what ASEAN can do. And I went to Dr. Surin's office and he looked at me and he said, how old are you? <laughs> I was like, what does that matter? He said, no, I mean, you're talking about ASEAN because I, at two th in 2004, I used to also consult with Senator Kitbon in Washington. So if anybody knows Senator Kitbon, he was actually a reporter in Thailand, and then he went to Washington to become a senator. And I was a big proponent of ASEAN. So me and Senator Kitbon was going around caring about ASEAN and all that. So I, I told Dr. Surin I was around you know, uh, 27, 28 at that time. He said, uh, make sure you learn while you are in this position. And he thought I was working for a company called ASEAN International Advocacy. I said, well, this is my own company. And then he said, OK, what do you have? What suggestions do you have? And I said, well, you know, first you need to have some kind of a format where you, you have interaction with the private sector. Because there's a lot of things the private sector can do to help uh, move ASEAN's agenda forward. Then he said, OK, fine, we'll get into that. And then from there on, I realized that he conducted once a month I think it was in this room. Once a month, there was a cocktail uh, reception where private sector would come, you know, have a few nibbles and interact with the ASEAN officials. And I thought that was brilliant because that actually helped us uh, forge this. So, and then afterwards, we worked on the ASEAN Economic 
community in terms of socializing it to the universities because if you talk to the uni students in the universities they do not know much about ASEAN and we try to do a website and have a communication platform but there on Dr. Surin has mentored me uh, you know I was this young ambitious you know getting out and all that and he sometimes he pushed me sometimes he pulled me back and he said okay now this is you're getting too aggressive and then okay now you need to be aggressive here so that was I, th I thought I should share this uh, you know I've, I've I was in Singapore when I heard of this demise and I just didn't know what to say because you know, I think it was a true big loss for all of us and, you know, again thank you for taking care of him so he could contribute at least in a small way in my life. Thank you. Adelina. For those who don't know, Adelina Kamau is the executive director of AHA Center, so frequently mentioned okay. in the video. was given to him to lead, he turned his back to me, to us sitting at the back and said, this is going to be a strong current. We just have to jump into it and learn how to swim. So we did. We stayed in Myanmar for two years and by far it was one of the greatest work experience I've ever had. We knew that well, while the current of the river was strong, Dr. Surin would, would be there to steer us through the strong current and save us from jumping freely into a waterfall. Second, <coughs> Dr. Surin always tried to do things that benefit others. Our last conversation was also about that. He called me on a Sunday from his pondok in Nakom Sitamarat. At the time, ASEAN countries just released a statement that talked about the new role of AHA Center. So we talked on what I planned to do, how he could help, and how he could make things better for this region and for the mankind. Not a typical Sunday conversation, but to me, he was practicing just what the Prophet Muhammad is still upon him said, that the best of people are those that bring most benefit to the rest of mankind. Dr. Surin did that until his very end. Inshallah, he was one of the best. Third, as a leader, Dr. Surin also connected to people around him at the personal level. After Nargis, I got the chance to see his family together with our common good friend, Tan Sri Dr. Jamilah Mahmud of Malaysia, we went to, to Nakom Sitamarat, met with the sisters, met Mama, met, went to the place that he loved the most. And that's when I got it. I got it. I got 
what made him such a great leader. He came from a family of teachers, good people who continuously spread the knowledge to others by teaching, by sharing, <clears throat> by inspiring others, by doing good to others, simply by doing that continuously. So when he left the world, I lost an important figure. He was always there for me through the difficult time in my life, even after he was no longer my boss. One of my old friends said to me, Lina, continue what he did. Do, do, sorry, do what he did to you and do that to others. Just that. And inshallah, I'm going to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Anybody else? Robin, you seem like you want to talk. Robin is a reporter based in Vietnam for the Han Kuk Daily from Korea. South Korean, like an expat outside of the ASEAN. I could know that much about ASEAN community. I learned so much things from him. The ASEAN will be uh, getting together, getting stronger community in, in this world to survive, to compete with other people, other countries. But he did it. He did it. Usually, when journalists have an interview, receive the gift from the interviewee. Yeah, I received so many gifts from my interviewee. Yeah, I'm spoiled so much things. But when I have an interview with him, I prepare a gift for him to give him. Because I thought that he could be a, yeah, the gift was spoon, coffee spoon. You know, the coffee spoon is steer everything in the cup, milk, water, sugar, and coffee. I thought him, he would be a play a role like coffee in ASEAN commu community. Yeah, after three, four months later, I heard the news, he passed away. I couldn't do anything in the day, yeah, on that so many days. But about one hour, one, one year later, I can see that that is not, a, not an end. I believe the people who attend today is following him. Everybody know he, what he did, what he wanted to do. I believe people here know that. So he's not here. At the same time, he is here. I believe. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Robin. If not waiting for you, I will exercise my right as an MC to give my experience of Dr. Su Dr. Surin. I worked eight months under Dr. Surin, uh, first eight months of his office in 2008. He is somebody who I call very media savvy. Talking points, we just give him five words, he can talk for one hour. So fluent, so eloquent, and you know, and the media love him because he can actually sell ice to the Eskimos, uh, we call it. But by and large, it was an honor to serve under him for eight months. Uh, and of course, we all miss him. That's why we are all here. All right. I, at this juncture, I would like to move on with your permission. If you have any personal tribute, please like our ASEAN Secretariat Facebook page and you can give your tribute because whatever we are doing now, we will put it up as a social media and you can revisit what happened today and give your tribute in the web book page. Uh, in the Facebook page. To respond and perhaps to sum up all the tributes and remembrance message shared today, I would like to invite Kun uh, Fiyadi Pitsuwan, the elder of the two sons of Dr. Surin, to the stage. Fiyadi is currently a doctorate, doctoral student at the prestigious University of Oxford in the Department of Politics and International Relations. At Oxford, he is a Claridon Scholar, which is a fellowship awarded to the top 2% of Oxford graduate students. He is also a fellow at the Harvard University Asia Centre and served as a teaching fellow in international relations and public finance. He received his Master in Public Policy from Harvard Kennedy School and his Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. Uh, Kun Fiaudi is also a co-founder of Beanspire Coffee and an investor in Barismo. So ladies and gentlemen, can I give you uh, Kun Fiaudi Pitsuwan? Please give a warm round of applause. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is much tougher than I thought it would be. His, ex His and Her Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude on behalf of the Pesuan family to the Secretary General of ASEAN, Lim Jok Hoi, uh, Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, Dr. Subachai Panichapak, Dr. Dewi Fortuna Anwar, Ambassador Dili Albert, Governor Sukumpan Boripat, Mr. Mediyatma Suryodi Ningrat, for your touching and wonderful tributes. I would like to also thank ASAC and Iria staff for organizing sponsoring this tribute for my father. Lastly, thank you distinguished guests for attending the event today in honor of my father. My father's career as an ASEAN section started out as a disappointment to me. It was on the eve of my college graduation ceremony when my father made a decision to fly back from the US back to the region because of the sever severity of the cyclone Nagis. That was how I was introduced to my father's tenure as the region's top diplomat. But of course, being a public servant family means my mother, my two younger brothers, and I are trained to make sacrifices. We understood and wanted our father to serve public interest. He had trained us well over the years. As an example, every year we would make a trip to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. when I was a student at Georgetown. We would reread the Gettysburg Address that is printed on the wall of the Lincoln Memorial. This is Lincoln's speech that ends with a provocative but righteous reminder that the government of the people 
by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This Lincoln's famous speech reflects how my father had lived his life. And in particular, it served as a guide to how he led the work here at the ASEAN Secretariat. He wanted the Secretariat to serve the government that served their people. This was shown through his focus on issues related to education, diplomacy, and human security. To this end, I'm hoping to continue the work that he started. Both my father and I knew that we would never finish, but we would need to keep moving closer to our elusive goals. I am in the process of starting up the Surin Pistawan Foundation that I hope to establish it as a permanent endowment in which only part of the profits would be used to run programs. This means that the impact of the organization will grow in size over time and it will be there to work on ASEAN issue forever. I plan for it to operate regionally. This foundation will focus on three key areas. Firstly, education, secondly, diplomacy, and thirdly, human security, which are the areas that my father is, was passionate about. <laughs> On education, the foundation aims to provide scholarships to young ASEAN students to study abroad within the, re the region and outside the region in order to both encourage ASEAN integration and academic excellence. We also hope to provide research funding on ASEAN and ASEC related issues, and I hope to work closely with IRIA and Habibi Center on these. On diplomacy, the foundation wants to fund programs related to interfaith dialogue and conflict resolutions in order to promote mutual understandings and further integration of ASEAN. On human security, the foundation hopes to assist in disaster relief in some capacity and other immediate development needs that will help secure the future of ASEAN citizens. It has been one year since I have lost my father and ASEAN has lost its biggest champions. It will take many years for me to overcome this grief and to build up this foundation and raise a sizable enough fund for the people, from the people who share his belief in an integrated and peaceful ASEAN that works as a single unit. I will need all your support and prayers going forward. Our struggle ahead, ahead for ASEAN will not fade away and will only aggravate if we cannot work together as one. Since my father's passing, it has been one more year where we saw two great powers engaging in economic and security tensions, nationalism on the rise across the globe, and climate change continuing to show how we have neglected our environment. We have to continue to deal with these challenges together. Dealing with these existential threats will require an effective ASEAN that functions as a single unit with coordinated policies. ASEAN will be as effective as we allow it to be. And our attitude towards it is reflected in the capacity of this place, the ASEAN Secretariat. An ASEC that will be effective, an ASEC will only be effective when collectivism prevails over nationalism. This is an important message and point that I believe my father has stood for and would want to emphasize in what may be the last speech by a Pitsuan at this venue. Let me end this last speech by a quote from my father that reflects his thinking. A stronger ASEAN will be better for the region. A stronger, prosperous, peaceful region will help the world by the comfort of knowing that there is one less region to worry about because ASEAN can take care of itself. Let's take care of ourselves. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Kun Fiyadi.
Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to our final event of the day. I would like to humbly invite Ibu uh, Surin, Mrs. Alicia Pisuwan, to come out to the stage. And as a symbol of appreciation, Yasen Secretariat uh, will offer a bouquet of flowers to Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Alicia Pisuwan. I would like to invite Ibu uh, Mita Moktan, spouse of DSG Moktan, to do us the honor. Please stay on stage. At this juncture, I would like to invite SG, DSG Moktan, all six prominent speakers, uh, Ambassadors uh, Tanang Singh and Ambassador Spon, to proceed to the stage for group photo with Mrs. Alisa Pitsuwan and her two sons. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it marks the end of today's tribute forum delegated to Dr. Surin Pitsuwan. I would like to thank everybody involved and your participants. And thank you to IRIA for the partnership in organizing this event. Thank you.